Hello, I'm Edward October. Over the years, I've narrated more ghost stories, horror shows, and creepypastas than I can count. And yet, the crimes discussed on our true crime podcast managed to scare the shit out of me. This program is not suitable for children or the faint of heart. If you are such a person, go ahead and switch off this podcast. Listen to something else. Are you still with us? Well, we've warned you. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I am fantabulous. Woo-hoo. And yourself? I'm doing well. Doing pretty I good? Am. I am. Mm-hmm. Things are great. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Fall's coming. I'm happy about that little Fall's chilly weather. Fall's coming. <sighs> yep, it is getting a little chilly. I love that too. Um, homecoming's next weekend. But the girls got their dresses. It was a feat. That's great. I'm ready to go. Ready to rock it. and roll. Well, I hear you have, so have I a little. I do. Okay, I can't talk right now. <laughs> I, I hear you have a little case for us. I do. I do. This is. I know you'll remember this. There's. This was. There was a made-for-TV miniseries. It was like a two-part series back <gasps> in '92, <gasps> starring Kelly McGinnis. Or McGillis, oh. sorry, Kelly McGillis, Harry Hamlin, Keith Carradine. <gasps> I do. I know exactly what this uh-huh. is. Uh huh. And that's this is what we're going to go today. It's based on a book that I actually found a few years back in a thrift store, and we sold the hell out of it when we were in the bookstores. So, I just watched this made for TV movie not that long ago. Did you? Yeah. Awesome. I'm a nerd. All right. Yes, you go. are. All right. Okay. All right. On June 3, 1985, in Summerfield, North Carolina, police watched in horror as a Chevy Blazer full of passengers exploded on NC-150 right before their eyes. There were no survivors. Within minutes, the dark clouds hovering in the sky let loose, dumping rain and hail on the grotesque scene. Quote, it was like the Lord was mad, one officer later said, like he was real mad. I mean, really pissed off. The events that led to this tragic moment are drenched in deep-seated resentment, paranoia, fear, obsession, and hatred. And by the time the carnage was over, nine people had died, three officers were wounded, three families were left in ruins, and those who survived were devastated. And it left everybody scratching their heads and asking why. Susie Sharp Newson was born in Reedsville, North Carolina, on Christmas Eve 1946. Reedsville, located in the north-central part of the state, is a small town of less than 15,000 people just 30 minutes from the Virginia state line. Located in the Piedmont area of the state, it's known for tobacco production and a distinct style of guitar picking called Piedmont Blues. The region is characterized by rolling hills, narrow valleys, deep weathered bedrock, and thick soils. Susie Newsom was born into the Sharp and Newsom families. Very wealthy. We're talking old antebellum families Mm. who were respected and loved in the community. She was incredibly proud of her heritage and loved North Carolina. Susie was known as Susie Q. And of course, you know, that makes sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And was named for her aunt, her mother's sister, Susie Marshall Sharp. Now, Susie Marshall Sharp was the first female in the United States to be elected chief justice of a state Supreme Court. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Her aunt was also named one of Time Magazine's Women of the Year in 1975. That's impressive. It really is. An incredible dark-haired, dark-eyed beauty, Susie Newsom was named the Queen of May in kindergarten. She also had a hair-trigger temper, flying off into a blind rage over the most minor of things. And these rages could be so severe that her mother would have to douse her with cold water to get her to calm down. Hmm. She was spoiled because her wealthy, doting parents, Robert and Florence Newsom, were concerned that their daughter might not survive childhood because of a heart murmur. So they gave her whatever she wanted. Intelligent and a straight-A student, Susie enrolled in Wake Forest College and was named Fraternity Sweetheart. While there, she met a basketball player by the name of Tom Lynch, and the two began dating. Tom also came from money. His parents, Chuck and Dolores Lynch, were originally from Pittsburgh. 
His father there was an accountant for General Electric, and by the time he retired, Tom's father was a millionaire. Money, 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 money. Mm-hmm. money. The Lynch family ended up in Louisville, Kentucky, and some reports say Dolores never really took to Kentucky, but her neighbor said that she was as lovely as possible. And by all accounts, Dolores was very close to her only other child, Tom's sister, Janie. In 1970, Tom Lynch and Susie Newsom were married in North Carolina. Tom's mother, Dolores, never cared for Susie. Maybe it was just the proverbial mother-in-law jealousy, you know, somebody's taking away my baby boy, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Or maybe Dolores simply disliked Susie because her, of her mother's intuition. You know, it probably told her that her son was about to make a big mistake. Either way, at the couple's elaborate wedding at the Greensboro Country Club, Susie and Dolores, unable to put their differences aside even for just that one day, had an argument that would set the tempo for the relationship from there on out. I think it had something to do with Janie's dress. I mean, something really silly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tom Lynch enrolled in dental school in Lexington, Kentucky, to take advantage of the in-state tuition prices. And since his parents were footing the bill, it was the appropriate thing to do. Now, Susie liked Louisville, but she always brought up her family name and accomplishments to anybody who would listen as if she was reminding them that she was kind of higher up on the food chain. And living so close to her despised mother-in-law was no big deal since the couple only saw her once in their four years there. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. When Tom joined the Navy Reserve, the couple moved to Beaufort, South Carolina. That's where their two sons were born. John was born in 1974 and James arrived in 1976. Susie was totally in her element in the city on Port Royal Island. Known for its delicious seafood and gorgeous beaches, Beaufort was awash in antebellum charm and architecture. After that, Tom joined a dental practice in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the family moved once again. Susie hated Albuquerque, and she was pretty loud about it. She was a Southern girl through and through and bragged about her Southern aristocracy to the people in New Mexico, which didn't endear her to many of them. Susie despised the hot, dry climate, the culture, the food, pretty much everything. I mean, she made some casual friendships with neighbors, which was done with general aloofness as though she was basically doing them a favor. Hmm. She's a charmer. That's not going to make you very many friends. Not at all. Now, Tom became aware of some startling behavioral issues in New Mexico involving Susie. Now, whether or not Tom had been oblivious to these issues up to that point, or if the move to Albuquerque was the beginning of a downward spiral for Susie, it's unknown. But at this time, neighbors noticed that Susie was outwardly physically abusive to her sons, John and James. And she was pretty much unapologetic. Like she told the neighbor that she had slapped John so hard that it knocked him across the room. One neighbor witnessed Susie beating the family dog with a plastic baseball bat. Oh, my gosh. And after James was taken to the hospital for a head injury, the nursing staff made family services aware of the situation, but no formal charges were ever filed. But the cracks in Susie's and Tom's marriage were now large, and the couple fought constantly. In 1979, with her grandfather ill, Susie packed up her boys and moved back to North Carolina to live with her parents, Robert and Florence. And once she settled in, Susie pretty much informed Tom that their marriage was over and that she would be filing for divorce and seeking full custody of the boys, which she did get. Now, Tom was only allowed to see his sons a few weeks in the summer and every other Christmas. The judge also ordered Tom to pay child support, alimony, and her Susie's college tuition, which it seems that Susie was kind of a professional college student. Mm-hmm. She changed majors a few times. Like there's one in the book, Bitter Blood by Jerry Bledsoe. She quit, what was it, business or something like that because her professors were stupid. So she changed it to oh. something else. You know, it's very telling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Newsoms lived in Greensboro, North Carolina, just south of Reedsville. And when Tom visited the boys in North Carolina shortly after that, Susie may have thought that maybe Tom was there to reconcile, right? Mm -hmm. But Tom, no, he had none of that, Mm -hmm. not at all. And it became clear that Tom didn't want her. He only wanted to see his kids. So out of nowhere, Susie moved herself and the boys to Taiwan in December of 1979. Taiwan, the country? Yep. She had some friends there and she planned to get a teaching job. 
Being the uh, professional college student that she was, Susie was taking Mandarin classes, and she thought that moving over to Taiwan would help her become more fluent in the language. And although Tom and Susie had a separation agreement in which she had full custody, she moved the boys to Taiwan without Tom's consent. And not only she can't do that, can she? She did it. (laughs) This was in the eighties, where you know the mothers usually got the kids anyway, and fathers had very little say. You know what I mean? They had yeah. to fight hard. But not only was the move the act of somebody who felt entitled and entitled to the ch- children exclusively, but it also showed that her manipulation tactics knew no bounds. Some believe she only made the move to get back at Tom for not wanting to reconcile. That's kind of what it sounds like to me. Not that it mattered since Susie couldn't stand living there either. I mean, she hated the congestion and the pollution and the fact that she lived in this tiny apartment with the, another family. So what'd she do? She moved back to Greensboro within six months and moved in with her parents again. Susie's mother, Florence, was concerned about her daughter's appearance. She was kind of getting very thin, very sickly looking. She was pale and she had lost her spark. Friends of the family kind of noticed that Susie was kind of becoming a bit paranoid. They blamed it on living so far away for six months in a country where she only knew a few people and couldn't really read the writing or speak the language well. So Florence did what many other mothers tend to do and criticized Susie's life choices. mm -hmm. And the two fought constantly. Knowing something was wrong, but not really sure what, Susie's mother suggested to make an appointment with Dr. Frederick Klenner. Dr. Klenner was also Susie's uncle. Oh. Frederick Robert Klenner Sr. was married to another one of Susie's aunts on her mother's side, Annie Hill Sharp. This was, you know, the other aunt, not the Supreme Court Justice aunt, but mm-hmm. it's same side. Mm-hmm. Lots of names to keep track of. So. I got you. I'm, I'm with you so far. All right. Dr. Klenner was a controversial figure. He met Annie Hill Sharp at Duke University, where Annie was just the second woman in Duke's history to graduate with a Bachelor of Science degree. Dr. Klinner's father was an immigrant from Germany, and their family was Catholic. This meant that Dr. Klinner was not a Southerner of long aristocratic lineage, nor a Protestant. And much to the opposition of both families, he and Annie married in 1937, and he set up practice in Reedsville, North Carolina. In addition to being an outsider, Dr. Klenner idolized Adolf Hitler and refused to desegregate his medical practice office until the 1980s. What? Dr. Klenner was controversial in many other ways as well. He pushed vast quantities of vitamin C and vitamin B12 onto his patients and declared he cured them of all illnesses that they might have had or might not even have had in the first Mm. place. Mm -hmm. One disease he supposedly cured with vitamin C shots for some of his patients was MS, cancer. Oh, Oh. no. He's kind of like a duck. He quacks. Anyway, his son, Frederick Robert Klinner Jr., known as Fritz, was born in 1954 and the first cousin to Susie Newsom. Fritz was handsome with a shock of dark hair and a thick, full beard, but he could never entirely live up to his father's standards. While he wanted to be a doctor like his father, his grades just weren't there and they began to slip. And so he quit the University of Mississippi. But while he was at school, Fritz wore a knife on his belt and he kept guns in his dorm room. And at the time, Fritz also began to make up stories about being a covert operative for the CIA and the FBI. Uh, mm -hmm. Fritz and his father both shared a love of military grade weapons and a hatred for communists that bordered pretty much bordered on obsession. So Fritz moved back home to Reedsville and lied to his family about graduating college. And when the, the, his diploma never arrived, Dr. Klinner confronted his son and Fritz was full of excuses as to why, you know, why he had lied. Why, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Dr. Klinner gave him a job at his clinic as an aide and the patients loved him. Shortly after, Fritz lied to his parents again about having sorted everything out with the University of Mississippi and that he was now accepted into Duke University, just like his father. Mm. And once again, his parents believed the lie. His father even went so far as to give him money for tuition and living expenses. So they didn't check up on that, knowing mm, his background? They just believed Mm. him? No, for several years. For years. Mm. Yeah. I guess that's because you want to see what you want to see. Exactly. 
when it finally came crashing in and his father finally discovered the truth, Dr. Klinner just put Fritz to work in his clinic full time rather than to humiliate him or admonish him. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Many called Fritz young Klinner, but there were a few that called him Dr. Crazy. (laughs) Well, okay. Mm -hmm. At this time, Susie Newsom Lynch started attending Dr. Klinner's clinic. She began taking vitamin C shots and started to become more paranoid and obsessed with germs and even made the boys start to take the vitamins. While Susie and Fritz knew each other since they were first cousins, the two had not been very close growing up. Well, for one reason, Susie was almost eight years older than Fritz. And for another reason, to most of the extended Sharp family, Dr. Klinner was strange and unpalatable. So most of the Sharps avoided Dr. Klinner and Annie's branch of that family. And honestly, this didn't bother Dr. Klinner, who preferred his isolation. If nobody ever came to visit him, he wouldn't need to explain why he had big blankets covering all the windows or why there was Nazi memorabilia, swords and guns decorating the house. And this is in the 70s and 80s, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Oof, okay. Or why there was so much clutter everywhere that there was no place to sit. But at this point in Susie's life, Fritz was precisely what she needed. And it's not publicly known of what made Susie trust Fritz, but the two quickly became very close. Very close. Oh. He sometimes would be found sleeping on the family's couch in the morning. Oh. Fritz regaled Susie with wartime stories of the Vietnam War, even though he'd never been in the military. (laughs) And while it became apparent to outsiders that the two were more than just friends, her family still refused to believe it. They continued telling themselves that the pair were close because Fritz and Susie were both going through a divorce. And they were comforting each other. Mm -hmm. Also, Susie was deeply embroiled in a custody battle with Tom. Every time they would get close to a financial agreement, Susie would refuse to sign and ask for some other condition or some more money. It became clear to Tom that Susie was holding the boys ransom, stating that if he agreed to whatever new thing she requested, she'd let him see the boys. But that never happened. She just kept pushing and pushing the goalposts. And while trying to meet some of her demands, He just got frustrated and just filed for divorce. They had been separated before. So Mm -hmm. you get that, right? Okay. Right. I don't know if that made sense. So attitudes towards custody have changed a great deal since the 1980s. Like I said, back then, custody was almost always granted to the mother automatically. And Tom believed that his children should be with their mother. I mean, that was the old mindset, right? He agreed that kids should be with their mother. He never wanted to take them away from her ever. He just wanted her to agree to a financial settlement a decent Mm -hmm. chunk of visitation time, and he just wanted to move on with his life. This was going on for years. Still thinking he could force her hand to make her agree to a financial settlement, Tom filed for full custody. And Susie predictably became enraged and hysterical, and she was convinced that Tom wanted to take her children from her forever. Her paranoia, disenchantment with the world, and her instantaneous anger towards anybody who disagreed with her began taking over her in every waking moment. Her animosity towards her mother was at a boiling point, too. Her mother was beginning to think the relationship between Susie and Fritz was inappropriate, and she disapproved. She had purchased a black chow dog, which her father didn't approve of, stating that they were unsuitable breed for a dog, especially to have around small children. And he's not wrong. They can be aggressive. They don't have a lot of patience, especially with young kids. Mm -hmm. There's actually a lot of groomers that won't groom chows by the way. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. So they're better suited for older folks. Older folks. They're great protecting dogs. Yeah. Yeah. And you need to get those things grewed because they're they're like bears, right? Yeah. They're cute, though. Yeah. And of course, it just couldn't be a simple conversation with differing opinions because with Susie, it always turned into a huge fight. And when her mother tried to intervene, Susie hit her mother. Things finally boiled over. Susie packed up her belongings and moved herself, the boys, and the dog into a small apartment in Greensboro and refused to speak to her parents. In late 1985, Tom and Susie's divorce was finalized, and Susie was granted everything that she wanted in the divorce. And it had been two years since Tom had seen John and James. That's too long. Way too long. And even though it wasn't officially his Christmas with the boys, since coming to a settlement had taken so long, he asked a North Carolina judge to allow him an exception for that year. The judge agreed to let Tom take the boys to New Mexico for Christmas, but ordered Tom to pay a $10,000 bond to ensure that he would return them. And he got that money back, right? He was, yeah. 
Okay. And on top of that, Susie told the judge that she didn't feel comfortable letting the boys change planes alone. So Tom had to fly to Greensboro to get the boys, spend a few days getting to know them again, and then he would take them back to Albuquerque. And then when it was done, he would fly them to Atlanta on a return flight where Susie would meet them and Mm -hmm. then go back to home. And of course, Tom had to pay Susie's flights. Hmm. Now, Tom's mother, Dolores Lynch, was outraged at how the chips had fallen. She was convinced Susie's aunt, the Supreme Court judge, Susie Marshall Sharp, had somehow influenced the trial because the judge presiding over the divorce seemed to concede to every demand Susie made. Judge Sharp denied those accusations until the day she died. Either way, Dolores wanted her son to return to court for more visitation time and left's money. She had only seen her grandsons three times in their young lives, yet she was helping Tom with airfare costs for the boys' visits to New Mexico. She wasn't even allowed to speak to her grandsons when she called Susie's house. And Susie even threw away gifts from Dolores and Tom, especially any food items sent, because, quote, they could be poisoned. And this was all because of Fritz would lie to Susie, turning her against Tom. Like he told her or he told everyone who would listen that Tom had only moved to smuggle drugs and he was planning to take the boys away from Susie and he was going to kidnap them. And of course, Fritz would say he knew all this because of his connections to the CIA. Mm -hmm. But don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. At this point, Susie also wouldn't allow her mother to see John and James, no matter how hard Florence tried. And with Fritz living in Susie's apartment, they fed off each other's paranoia, and the Newsome could no longer deny, at least privately, the context of her daughter's relationship with Fritz privately. In the meantime, Fritz was spending time in gun shops, and he would talk about his time in the war, being in the CIA, which were all lies we know. Mm -hmm. He'd talk about cyanide and making pills out of cyanide, you know, normal things that you talk Mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He also spoke about people that he didn't like, right? People who spoke ill of him or his dad. Oh. Minorities. Susie's parents were also on that list. Oh. And two men who knew Fritz didn't believe a word he spewed, but they did look into him a bit. And when they did check him out, they discovered that Fritz didn't have his medical license, even though he was practicing medicine at his father's practice. And they told the police... And essentially, nothing was done. And when it came time for Tom to have the boys for spring break, Susie tried to cancel the visit. But Tom got a court order and Susie, having no choice, sent the boys to Tom in New Mexico for their scheduled visitation. When the boys got off the plane, Tom was kind of shocked. Tom was there with his new wife, Kathy. They were both shocked. The boys were gaunt. They looked malnourished and their clothes were ill-fitting. Oh, And in addition, they came with a bag of vitamins that their mother had sent with them. Tom, of course, immediately threw the vitamins out and bought the boys new clothes and shoes. And the boys talked about their Uncle Fritz often and about how he took them camping and hunting. And this was new to Tom because he wasn't really aware of what was with what was happening back home with Susie. And the boys didn't tell their dad that they called Fritz Papa or that Susie and Fritz were dating, living together, dating. Is it called dating when it's your cousin? When they're living together? I would think so. It's, I Maybe guess, just depends on where you live. I don't perpetual, know. Perpetual family reunion Maybe. every day? I don't, I don't know. know. And anyway, that visit, that was the best visit Tom had had with the boys in a long time. They went camping and they played outside. They spent time. The boys just spent time being kids, right? Mm-hmm. But it was during that visit that Tom received a phone call that would change his life and so many others' lives forever. On July 24th, 1984, Kentucky police called Tom, informing him that his mother, Dolores Lynch, and his sister, Janie Lynch, both were found murdered at the Lynch's home. What? Dolores was found by a friend who became worried when her calls to the house went unanswered. The friend unfortunately found Dolores dead in the driveway. She had been shot several times. It was apparent that she had been dead for at least a few days, and in the southern heat, this meant she had already begun to decompose. Janie, according to Kentucky newspapers, was found in a second floor dressing room, having been shot several times in the torso and once in the neck. Judging by the blood trail left throughout the house by Janie, it appeared that she had been trying to make it to the phone, presumably calling 911. And there was no evidence the bodies were moved or that they had been sexually assaulted. 
Authorities assumed that it was just a robbery since a few jewelry boxes had been rifled through, but nothing else in the house had been taken. Since Tom's father, Charles, had died about seven months prior, Janie had moved in with her mother and they had put in an alarm system. But uh, it appeared as though that it was the alarm system was not on at the time of the murders. There were no shell casings left at the crime scene either. To authorities, the murder of the Lynch women was beginning to look like more of a professional hit, but they Mm -hmm. just didn't know why. There's no reason to kill these two women. And um, Tom was questioned, but he was cleared. Authorities posted a $10,000 reward for information, but no information ever came. Tom Lynch was devastated. He lost his whole family. His father had died seven months prior, like I said, and now his mother and his only sibling had been brutally murdered. All he had left at this point were his boys. He called Susie in North Carolina and begged her to let the boys stay a little longer so they can grieve as a family. And Susie simply said that, no, can't, hung up. No, can't. She simply said, no, I'm I'm making it. I know, but I'm just like, yeah. She's something. That's heartless. Mm -hmm. The boys, well, she's thinking Fritz is telling her he's kidnapping her. He's kidnapping the kids. I mean, you know, the boys cried and hung to their father at the airport. They didn't want to leave either, but there was nothing Tom could do. I was going to say, poor things probably got solid food. (laughs) Uh They didn't want to leave. They weren't around crazy. That's or stress. I can't imagine how stressful that household was. After the funeral of his mother and sister, Tom reached out to his former in-laws, Robert and Florence Newsom, in North Carolina. Tom was haunted by the condition of his sons the last time he'd seen them, and he was now convinced that he had to get more visitation and access to his boys. And in his correspondence with the Newsoms, the subject of John and James, of course, came up, and eventually the Newsoms agreed to testify in court on Tom's behalf. They agreed that the boys should spend more time with him, and they also agreed that the conditions that the boys lived in with Fritz and Susie were toxic. Now, calling themselves husband and wife, Susie and Fritz were being eaten alive by their paranoia. Their apartment had become like the older Clinner's home, with heavy blankets hanging on all the windows. Gun and ammunition were littered throughout the house, and war propaganda posters hung in the boys' room. Oh my gosh. Fritz and Susie now had two chow dogs who behaved aggressively towards outsiders. And this, unfortunately, alienated John and James from the other children, even more since parents really don't want their children. They didn't want their children at the apartment because aggressive dogs, right? Right. And John and James weren't allowed to go to their friends' houses. So the boys were just being isolated. When Dr. Fritz's father, Dr. Klinner, passed away, it was a year prior, though, Fritz kept seeing his patients after his father died. Giving him shots. For a year, right. Giving whatever. Just being a doctor, practicing being Mm -hmm. a doctor when he wasn't a doctor. And it wasn't until Susie's aunt, Susan, Justice Mm -hmm. State, she called a friend at Duke University to check on Fritz's school records. And sure enough, she found out that he had never even enrolled there. And Susan made some phone calls and got the practice closed for good. Good. So it took somebody of power. To do something. He'll be mad now, though. Mm -hmm. Fritz was given about $25,000 from his father's estate, which is the equivalent of $84,000 today. But in less than a year, Fritz and Susie had spent most of the money on what, you ask? Let me tell you. Weapons, survival Mm. items, tents, knives, canteens, you know, vitamins, food rations, and uh, large amounts of cyanide. Oh, So, Cam, Yes. the other day I was sitting around and I was reminiscing about how much fun we had in college when we would go down and play bingo. (gasps) Oh, wow. We always had a blast, didn't we? We really did. Yeah. In fact, I was feeling so nostalgic for that that I went and downloaded the game Bingo Bash. No way. Yep. And little did I know that not only it's so much fun to play, but it's also one of the top free bingo games available to download. Oh, my gosh, Jen, you're going to die. Guess what? I've been playing that game for a while now. No way. Absolutely love it. That's amazing. There's so many different bingo rooms with unique themes and so many unlimited twists on the basic bingo game. Yep. I mean, I cannot wait to get to the one called Case Closed. Have you heard that one? Ooh, no. Tell me more. So, you know, that's perfect for us because true crime related and all that. Mm -hmm. In this game, you uncover hidden secrets. Ooh, I love a good hidden secret. Don't we all? 
Plus, I love how each room has a mini game where you can get rewards that help you bingo faster. Oh, those mini games really help me level up. They really do. And I'm telling you, Bingo Bash came in handy this weekend when I was out shopping for a homecoming dress with my youngest. Oh, I do. It helped me pass the time because you know how she is. She was playing Goldilocks, you know, in those dressing room for hours. <laughs> I'm telling you, this dress is too short. This dress is too long. But anyway, I don't want to brag, but I've only been playing for a few days and I'm number three on the leaderboard. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. That's right. So I challenge all of our listeners. I want you to go download it, the game today and try to get me off number three. I bet you can't do it. Oh, I bet I can. I'm going right now. No, nope. you're done. Nope, nope. So all of our listeners, please go download Bingo Bash today on iOS or Android devices and enjoy the 200 chip welcome bonus that's going to help you kick off your bingo adventure. Come on, you guys got to do it. Promise me. It is fun. Yeah. Download Bingo Bash for free today on Google Play or Apple Store and join the bingo fun. Days before the custody hearing in which Susie's parents were going to testify on Tom's behalf, friends of the Newsoms went to check on the couple. And according to a newspaper from the time, family friends were concerned because they hadn't heard from them for a few days. It was May 19th, 1985, and Robert and Florence Newsom were selling their home and moving in with Robert Newsom's mother, Hattie, who was 85 years old, also known as Nana. Hattie's estate was worth about 900000 at the time. And the home, bought in 1930s and located in Old Town, was considered the family homestead. And if I remember correctly, I want to say Maya Angelou lived around the same neighborhood that they did. Oh, really? Yeah. They're like, they're wealthy. Like I'm saying, they're very prestigious people. Yeah. So when the friends went to check on them, they knocked on the door and they didn't get an answer, even though all the lights in the house were on. They peered into the windows and got the shock of their life. There was blood everywhere throughout the house, and the horrified friends raced next door and called 911. Investigators found Robert Newsom dead in the hallway near the busted back door. The two women, Florence and Hattie, were found in the living room with the television on. Hattie was lying on the couch covered with an afghan, and all three victims had been shot, but Florence had also been stabbed. Her throat was also sliced. Investigators believed for a while that the motive for the killing was a robbery, but only two items of jewelry could definitely be said to have been missing. However, Hattie's gold Plymouth Valair was missing, too. Robert and Hattie seemed to be killed execution style, while Florence's murder was brutal, classic overkill. Whoever killed Florence was angry. And there's no shell casings to be found at this crime scene either, just like Dolores and Jane's. Janie's. One thing investigators noted was that there could have been two killers since the bodies were close to each other. Hmm. Robert Newsom III, Susie's brother, found himself in the same boat Tom had just been in the year before. He'd lost his mother and his father and his grandmother to a deranged gunman. When Robert was questioned at the scene about who could have committed this crime, Robert III mentioned that his sister Susie's ex-in-laws had been murdered in Kentucky the previous summer. So instead of testifying in court at the custody hearing on Tom's behalf, Robert Newsom, his wife Florence, and his mother Hattie were buried instead. Now, Susie's was quite unaffected by the death of her parents and grandmother, and it's rumored that she inquired about the whereabouts of her grandmother's furs at the funeral. At the funeral. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Upon hearing the news in New Mexico, Tom immediately called the Kentucky state detectives to tell them what had happened. Kentucky detectives drove to North Carolina to come through the murder scene and the case files to see if there's any clue to point to a connection to the murders of Dolores and Janie Lynch. Unfortunately, the gun used in North Carolina slayings were not the same guns used in the Kentucky murders of the Lynch women. And while police found some similarities in the case, much of it could be dismissed as coincidental. But then, during the investigation, the police discovered a 21-year-old philosophy student named Ian Perkins. And the story he would tell them was like something out of a spy novel. Ian Perkins had been friends, acquaintances with Fritz Klenner, and Ian had told Fritz that he wanted a career with the CIA or FBI. So one day, Fritz approached Ian and said that he would be more than happy to put Ian in touch with his contacts at the CIA. But 
he would need him to do just one small job first, Mm -hmm. kind of like an audition of sorts. Now, it's easy in hindsight to think that Ian Perkins was beyond gullible, right? But he grew up with Fritz talking about his military operations and undercover government work. Fritz would take him to the shooting range and on camping trips before. Ian had been young and impressionable and in some respects in awe of Fritz Klinner, you know, who he thought was a doctor, right? Everybody thought he was a doctor. Um, He had no reason not to believe Fritz's CIA stories. On the weekend of the Newsom murders, Fritz took Ian camping, and this would be his alibi. He told Ian that he had been assigned to wipe out a communist cell in the area, and Fritz told Ian that his communist cell was smuggling weapons to South America and trading them for drugs, which would then be sold to profit the communists' cause. Ian agreed to be Fritz's alibi. He drove Fritz to the operation point and picked him up when the mission was ended, which coincidentally, was about a half a mile from Hattie's house. Oh. Ian felt sick to his stomach when the police informed him that Fritz wasn't a CIA agent or FBI agent for that matter. Hell, he wasn't even a real doctor. And even though Ian hasn't physically hurt anybody, he felt partially responsible. And the truth is, the Newsoms would have most likely been killed anyway, even if he hadn't agreed to help. But Ian was distraught and overcome by guilt. So police asked Ian to wear a wire and try to get Fritz to confess. And Ian immediately agreed. Ian tried two times, but Fritz wouldn't admit to anything. On June 2nd of 1985, Ian tried for the third time to get Fritz on tape confessing to the murders. That third time, Fritz seemed to understand that the police were closing in on him and told Ian, quote, I'll write a paper stating that you were not knowingly involved, that you believed you were on a covert mission for the government. He ended his visit with Ian saying, quote, I've got things to do. I won't see you again. Police finally had enough to get a signed warrant. However, there's been some criticism of the police for not pulling the vehicle over immediately and arresting Fritz. After all, in the conversation with Ian, Fritz had basically admitted that he wouldn't be taken alive. And not only did he say he would, quote, pop a capsule, meaning a cyanide pill, but he also told Ian that he wouldn't be seeing him again. So there was probable cause and the children's well-being to think about. But the police didn't arrest Fritz then, and some people feel that it could have meant all the difference for John and James Lynch. The following day, with undercover cars and agents surrounding the building, law enforcement wanted to get Fritz out of the apartment and away from Susie and the boys. Then they would arrest him, which makes sense. At 2.38 p.m., while police were still formulating about how to go about removing Fritz from the apartment, the undercover agents surrounding the building reported that they had just seen Fritz and Susie load the black Chevy Blazer with large duffel bags, the Uh two dogs, and surprisingly, two little boys dressed in camouflage fatigues. Uh Uh-oh. Police didn't expect the boys to be there because it was a school day and they just assumed that the boys would be in class. Mm -hmm. Officers from several different agencies descended upon the apartment building and followed as Fritz drove through the streets of Greensboro. Nobody fully understood where they were going or where they would stop or how this would end. When officers cornered the blazer at the intersection, police thought that they might have a chance to get Fritz out of the car. Unfortunately, Fritz shoved an Uzi out of the driver's side window and, with a grin, opened fire on the police. Oh. One officer was hit in the chest, but luckily he'd been wearing a bulletproof vest. He was sore, but he was fine. Wounded, I guess I should say, but he yeah. was, he would he make survived. it. He survived. At the next intersection, police managed to corner Fritz again. At this point, Fritz jumped out of the car and opened fire on civilians and law enforcement alike. Police returned fire. Miraculously, no civilians were harmed and only two additional police officers were injured. Fritz jumped back in the car, rammed the other cars until he could clear them, and then drove away. More gunfire was exchanged with Fritz flashing the police of that wicked smile as he drove by. Mm -mm. But shortly after that, Fritz slowed the car to about 10 miles per hour and police were getting prepared. They, you know, were going to take him Mm -hmm. when he jumped out. But instead of jumping out and exchanging gunfire like they expected, Fritz stayed in the car. Police heard pop, pop, pop. (gasps) And then the brake lights came on. 
Oh, no. It's impossible to overstate the sheer pandemonium and chaos along the road. When Fritz's car came to a stop, it was right across from a school bus. Children's dogs and civilians were everywhere milling about. Suddenly, there were flames seen from underneath Fritz's car. At 3.07 p.m., an explosion rocked the blazer and everything in the immediate vicinity. The blazer was in pieces and debris fell from the sky. The passenger side door was lodged 50 feet up into a pine tree. The explosion was so loud that people heard it 10 miles away, and any thoughts of finding survivors were soon painfully and horrifyingly obvious. There weren't any. Susie was missing most of her legs, but her body was surprisingly intact from the waist up. She had been sitting on the bomb when it went off. Officers found Fritz face down in a ditch about 100 feet away from the blazer. He drowned in his blood before officers could question him. His Rolex stopped at 3.08. The boys were found behind where the passenger seat used to be, and their small arms wrapped around their dogs. Mm. Within minutes, the heavens opened and the rain and hail poured down, and when the storm passed, hot steam lifted off the road in thick swirls as if somebody had just put out the fires of hell. Debris from the blazer was found as far as 100 yards from the explosion. Police collected a small arsenal of weapons, ammunition, and a stack of $100 bills in a plastic baggie. Loose vitamins were scattered everywhere, and St. Joseph prayer cards were near the body. And for those that don't know, St. Joseph is the patron saint of dying, basically, amongst other things. In the aftermath of the explosion and the ghastly deaths of the occupants of the blazer, a few things came to light. While both boys, John and James Lynch, had been shot in the head, they had also been given doses of cyanide. Why both? There's much speculation as to who shot the boys. I don't know. We don't know this. Some people believe that Fritz was responsible for everything. Fritz was the manipulator, the paranoid one, the protector. Whatever annoyed Susie, he would fix it. But Susie's ex-husband, Tom, quickly points out that Susie was also a master manipulator and would stop at nothing to get what she wanted. She was driven, fueled by jealousy and hate, and he thinks she played Fritz to do her bidding. This was Susie's husband, ex-husband Tom, thinks that Susie was the one that did all this to Fritz, or made Fritz do all this. During the autopsy, it was found that Susie had gunshot residue on her hands, so it is possible that she did pull the trigger. In the upcoming weeks of investigations, it was concluded that Fritz Klinner and Susie Newsom had murdered Tom's mother and sister. Dolores and Janie Lynch. Phone records show that Susie had called the Kentucky police asking for details on the murder of the Lynches before Tom even had been informed that his parents were dead or that his mother and sister were dead. Phone records show that Susie immediately called Fritz after receiving a call from Tom to tell her of his mother's death, which, of course, she already knew. The gun used to kill Dolores and Janie was finally tracked down by Kentucky police. It belonged to Fritz and Susie. And the police could show that after the shootings of Dolores and Janie in Kentucky, the day after the murders, Fritz and Susie had sold the gun back to the dealers from who they originally bought it from. The gun dealer located in Kentucky said that he saw Fritz and Susie when they sold the gun. Susie was in Kentucky with Fritz when the lynches were murdered. If Susie was an innocent bystander, she had ample opportunity to stop Fritz or even turn him in after the fact, but she didn't. And even though it's still speculation, Kentucky police think that Susie was the one to kill her mother-in-law while Fritz chased Janie throughout the house. A grand jury agreed that Susie and Fritz were responsible for the Lynch murders, and the case is now officially closed. In North Carolina, however, investigators disagreed. They believe that Fritz acted alone. To most outside the family, the singular brutality inflicted on Susie's mother, Florence, is enough to convince them of Susie's involvement. Perhaps the police assumed that as long as Fritz Klenner was named the murderer, that's good enough for them. Maybe laying blame on Susie Newsom for her parents' murder was a step too far. Or perhaps, as a last act of compassion for Hattie, Robert, and Florence, they've just decided to leave Susie's name out of it. After all, it would be tragic to go down in history as being murdered by your daughter. Face, mm-hmm. you know, famous, you know, yeah. family, you know. But if we you don't know. Did we it. don't know. As far as we know, it was just Fritz. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that. As for Ian Perkins, even though most agreed that Ian had believed that Fritz was a covert agent for the CIA, 
the Newsom family wanted him held legally responsible for his part in the killings. Their stance was that Ian had known Fritz would kill somebody that night, a CIA agent or not. The judge mostly agreed, but considered that Ian had aided investigators in getting a semi-confession, putting his own life on the line. And so Ian was sentenced to four months in prison, plus five years probation. During the investigation, police found the promise note written by Fritz exonerating Ian in his apartment. They found three other letters, too. One was basically a last will and testament kind of thing, leaving specific items to his mother. Another was a protest of his innocence, saying that he feared a massive cover-up was in play. And the fourth note simply stated, Mother, I love you now and always. Your Fritz. They also found an arsenal of weapons in their apartment, including rifles for the boys. There were also thousands of rounds of ammunition, knives, martial arts, weapons, mace, gas masks, bulletproof vests, a police scanner, and a parabolic microphone. Parabolic microphone, if you don't know, it's used to kind of single out a source. Like, it's used in surveillance. You know, it's got like that, almost looks like an umbrella on the microphone. You know what I mean? It can pick up sounds up to 50 meters away. They use those a lot in football games so that you Mm -hmm. can hear the players talk to each other. And they use them in like nature things. Yeah. I mean, it's used for more than just surveillance, but you know what I mean? I do. I'm just wanted to say what it was. Ultimately, the most heartbreaking aspect of the case is the boys. John and James Lynch were physically abused by their mother, poisoned with an overload of vitamins, and refused all the ordinary pleasures of childhood, like playing sports, playing outside, having friends, just being normal. Or having a loving relationship with other family members. Like she kept them from her own, their own father and grandparents. Mm-hmm. They, of course, were at the center of this entire drama. They seemed to be both used by their mother and at the same time, dearly coveted. And it was almost as if she hated them while simultaneously loving them to suffocation. Susie Sharp Newsom knew when they packed up the blazer that day that they would battle until the end. She and the boys were draped with a Catholic scapular, which is a cloth sometimes worn by Catholics around their neck as a symbol and reminder of their faith. It's basically a wearable, a wearable prayer. It wasn't something Susie and the boys usually wore, but they wore it that day. In all the fervor and scandalous details of first cousins sleeping together, killing and kissing cousins, and the flashy headlines of a socialite turned murderess, We get pulled away from what's truly important in this case, with all the gossip in the grocery store lines about old antebellum family members going insane, or even the bizarre behavior of the Clinners with their Nazi memorabilia and obsession with vitamins. The two tiny boys, James and John, who were only aged 9 and 10, they get lost in the story. Babies. Babies. So the fear of John and James must have had when they climbed into that Chevy... I mean, they really only wanted to be children. Awful. The beautiful lush green trees passed their car windows as their mother's lover sprayed bullets at innocent people. I can only imagine how fast their little hearts were beating. They don't, so, they're kids. They don't no. have a choice. No. And can you imagine the moment that they saw the gun what pointed was happening? at mm-hmm. them, at the gun pointed at them. Just so anyway, that is the tragic story of a twisted tale. I mean, I can't, I don't even, it's, so, the whole story is insane. I it mean, is. Just, well, definitely some mental illness it's not going even a story. on there. It's, it's not even a story. It's like a real, it really happened. It's, yeah. Mental and I wonder, illness. <laughs> wonder, why would they give the babies, the kids, cyanide and, a, and then shoot them? So part of me is wondering if one of them gave them one thing and then the other did the shooting. That way, well, it's two things. Either they didn't know that the other one was going to do that, you know, mm-hmm. or maybe... The cyanide I, wasn't taking effect quickly. It could have been that maybe Susie didn't want to see the boys suffer when that's what the I cyanide hit. Yeah, so, so they, she put them... Mm, like, yeah. did not... They didn't want them to suffer, so wanted it to happen quick, right. quicker. Right. I don't know. Absolutely. That's you know, a heartbreaking I, story. And I remember watching this in 92. I remember the book by Jerry Bledsoe. I actually found it. I don't know if I mentioned this at the beginning, but I found it a few years back at a thrift store. But it is ultimately one of the most bizarre, just the journey, the journey into the darkness and the paranoia. And the whole thing is just. Well, it's just two mentally ill people find each other. 
you know? Mm -hmm. So like if she would have found somebody else and he would have found somebody else, maybe this wouldn't have happened. I, they, I don't know. They egged each other on. Yeah. And they just went in the downward spiral together. Yeah. I, it's just, and those two boys suffered. And Tom, of course, suffered. The grandparents suffered. They've lost their lives. You know, I mean, it's just. For what unreal. though? That's the thing. Did they just, I, I don't know. I don't know. And we'll never know really because. No, everybody's gone. Mm. Everybody's gone. I do remember so, Bitter Blood, the book, and I remember mm -hmm. the cover in the yep. bookstore. I do, too. Wow. I do, too. Well, I, of course, I know it. I found it at the thrift, thrift store. I still have it. It's very well worn, by the way. That means it was read a lot Yeah. before best, it made it to the thrift around. store. Mm -hmm. Well, and you just think that, you know, this has all the makings of a salacious thing. You have the wealthy family. Oh. You have the, you know, the old Southern charm. Like right. it has all it's the the money, the wealth, the privilege, and the illicit affair between two family members, and uh -huh. they both spiral out of control into paranoia. And yeah, I mean, it's it is a made for TV movie, right? And it's you wouldn't even think that it would ever happen because it's almost it's fake. almost too much. Right. Yeah, it's almost too much. It's always stuck with me. It's a one of crazy. those things, right? Mm -hmm. But those poor boys, nine and ten, man. They uh -huh. didn't have a chance. Nope. It's just, <sighs> I, um, I don't even know what else to say about it. I think. I don't either. Just, I don't know. It's just, just, like I said, two people, uh, you know, finding each other and together, everything might've been fine, but they, mm -hmm. I don't know. And then and the, the father not helping things with letting his son lie about going to school and then being a doctor and then lie about going to school. And then that's okay. Come and be a doctor anyway. Well, you don't want to I mean, hurt the family name. I yeah, mean, but make him go get a different job. He's practicing you would medicine. Think, That's that that right there is insane. Well, I don't think he was all there to begin with either. I mean, he was. You got a sore throat? Oh, take some vitamin C. MS, vitamin C. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, he probably had his mental problems too. Yeah, I would not say that so I'm too. a doctor or can or don't play one on TV and don't go to school, but yet practice. Yeah, right. I don't know. It, oh, that was interesting. It's very sad. Dramatic. Story. Very dramatic. All those that um, were involved, too. Oof. The police officers, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand people, but I guess I'm not supposed to. Yeah. Or else I would. So I know that was kind of heavy. Let's, you want to do like a little brightening up a bit? Why don't Maybe, we? Maybe do you have anything exciting that you're watching on TV? Maybe just do like, since this is kind of long, maybe do like a quick little... Well, I do, I, for the listeners that are around our age, you'll appreciate this. Mm -hmm. So I started watching a movie this morning, and I'm only not even halfway through it, but it is so reminiscent of the 80s movies, and it's very reminiscent of Heather's. And it's some, I believe it's called Someone is in the House. Ooh. And it's just kind of, I don't know, It's I think it's sort of a mockery a little bit. But if you remember those movies from the 80s, when I would go stay at Jen's house and we'd stay the night and watch scary movies and stuff. Mm -hmm. This is this reminds me of that. Oh. But it's it's current. But it's, you know, so they're, in the 80s. You, no, 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 not even. It just reminds me of that kind of movie. Oh, God. like you know, a slasher? Uh, yes. Kind of yes. Thing? Yes. Yes. What's it called again? I'm sorry. It's called There's Someone in Your House. The graduating class at Osborne High is being targeted by a masked assailant intent on exposing the town's darkest secrets. So everybody that he's or she or they, we don't know yet, is being that is being killed in the movie. It's like, you know, have some sort of they have a little secret that this oh. person wants. So they're not very nice people is the point. But oh, it's very reminiscent of Heather's. If you remember the movie Heather's and it's uh, reminiscent of those 80s slasher, slasher. films. So it's like Heather's meets jason type thing kind of yeah awesome well Meets there's dexter i ah, guess dexter. gotcha teenage dexter put it that way um i did see a trailer for something i think it's coming to hulu on the 22nd so just a couple days after this airs it's called no one will save you oh what's that about it looks like it's some kind of alien creepy scary movie like oh. yeah it's uh my husband and i watched it and he's like "Ooh, it kind of reminds me of signs Ooh, kind of, I like Signs. I watch Signs once a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks really, really good. Like there's at one point you hear like little footprints or like little tiny feet walking across the floor real quickly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it, it looks really yeah. good. Side and effects. Good. Yeah. It's mm. mostly shot in the dark. It looks really good. I'm looking forward mm. to it. So mm. I will be 
at my TV when that airs. Yeah, so. me too. Um, it is spooky season, and you know, it is. It is. I watched scary, scary. Another scary movie I watched was called and. What I recommended, I don't know. Check it out. It's an Australian film um, called Run, Rabbit, Run. And oh, yeah. the, do you know what I'm talking about? The yep. lady that stars in it was in succession. Mm-hmm. So it was interesting. It I held my attention. I hated it. I you hated did not it. like it. Why not? I just did not like it whatsoever oh. at all. I thought it was stupid. Oh, okay. That's okay. That's yeah, okay. no. Yeah, no, I didn't mm-hmm. like it. Yeah, no. It, yeah, no. <laughs> no, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> I th- I thought it was dumb. And in fact, my husband's like, I need to watch this because he really loves Succession, you know, mm-hmm. which I do too. But he like loves it, and he liked her character. He's mm-hmm. like, I need to watch it. And I'm like, Yeah, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't need. To I watch don't know. It. I I try to. I like I like movies where I don't know anything about them, and I don't look them up because I hate when people are like, This movie's so good. Yeah. And then you watch it, and I'm like, It wasn't very good. And then I'm like, So so I like watching movies that I've never heard anybody talk about, things like that. Yeah. So yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't like it, but I suggest everybody go, go watch it and tell us what you think. See if you would recommend it. I mean, it's not an Academy Award winner, that's for sure. But, you know, during spooky season, you just got to find stuff to watch. No, I didn't like it. Speaking of M. Night Shyamalan, this is one I know I've been watching too many movies. He did a movie a couple of years ago and it was pretty good called Devil. Did you Mm -hmm. see that? Yep. You did with the elevator? Uh Yep. Liked it. So see, I like that too. So you Mm -hmm. check that out. I thought that was good. Anything else you've been watching? No, that's it. That's it. I do know that you and I are going to be getting a psychic reading here in a few minutes. Is well, it, separately. T- is it tarot card or psychic? She's psychic. She, it's, she's on the podcast. She does a to- podcast called I Talk to Ghosts. Oh. And um, so she's going to do a psychic reading for us today. So we, you'll have to, uh, we'll let you know when it airs and you'll see if anybody comes through for us. So that's make sure you take notes. Things. I was going to take, take notes. notes just yeah. because sometimes you don't, they might say something and we don't know what that means. And then, exactly. Yeah. Yep. But anyway, we'll, we'll keep you posted on when that airs, but it's Jennifer from I Talk to Ghosts. So something for our spookiness. For spooky Halloween. season. Spooky season. But anyway, that's all I have. All we right, should probably Jen. get off here so I could go meet my spirits. Go meet your spirits. Or at least go nice to the bathroom to before my spirits come. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, or that. All right, Jen, until next time, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, Bye-bye. Love ya. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at ourtruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at wetalkofdreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash our true crime podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love you.